very good morning to each one of you. Welcome to our online service this morning. It's so wonderful that we enter into a new month, the first day of a new month today. We praise God for His faithfulness to us this year. Let me read for you a scripture verse. It says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. Psalm 133-4. Isn't it amazing that God does not treat us as we deserve? Because the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Psalm 103, verse 8 and 10. At this time, we'd like to invite you to just bow your head in quietness and ask the Lord to forgive you if there's anything that needs forgiveness in our life so that we would be able to worship Him the way that He deserves. So shall we all just bow our heads in prayer silently. the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much, God, for your grace, for your mercy, how you are so merciful. We want to praise you. God, we are sinners. We are unworthy. Yet, God, because of Jesus and what Jesus did on that cross, we are redeemed by his blood and we are cleansed from sin. And it is because of your grace and your grace alone. Lord, at this time, as we go into the rest of our worship, I pray that, Father, we would have our hearts rem remember that we are saved by grace and we would continue to go into our worship with that. Lord, if anybody is worshiping with us today who feels that they are unworthy, who feels that they are undeserving, may they be reminded that your grace is sufficient for them, God, that your power is made strong in their weakness, God. I pray that they would turn to you, Abba Father, that they would cry out to you in Jesus' name. 
I pray for the sermon that will be brought before us, that God, wh what you have placed um, in the heart of Dad to speak, I pray that God, as he speaks, Lord, it would be a blessing to us, O Lord, and I pray that as we hear your word, we would be enriched and we would draw closer to you. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Sar shishti ke malik tumi ho Sar shishti ke rakshak tumi ho Karte hai tujko sadar pranam Gaate hai tere hi kunda Sar shishti ko tera sahara Sar shankar to hear God's word this morning shall we sing this song prayerfully saying Lord here I am to worship you with my whole being thank you Lord for what you did on the cross for me I'll never know how much it cost you we thank you Lord we worship you light of the world you step down into darkness oh
we begin a new series of messages from this Sunday entitled Just Like Us. In fact, I was tempted to call this series the COVID examination. Why was I tempted to call it the COVID examination? You know, as we've gone through this uh, season of the COVID, the last couple of years, an unprecedented time, an unusual time in each one of our lives, there have been many who have written to me, there have been many who have called me, and there have been many who have asked me, does the Bible have a story? Does the Bible have a few passages? Does the Bible have answers? for what I've been through in this season. You know, our lives have changed as a result of this COVID pandemic. Before the COVID, there were so many things we did not know that we know now. Many of us use Zoom platform. We use all kinds of online platforms. In fact, this message is coming to you in your house thanks to the COVID season. So we've learned a lot through this season, but let's be honest, it's been a season that has been frustrating. It's been a season which, which has actually taken a toll on our lives. We've lost loved ones. We've gone through great struggles. We've gone through uncertainties. And sometimes we've asked ourselves, does the Bible have a passage of scripture? Does the Bible have a character? Does the Bible have something in it that I can go back to and try and evaluate what I've been through in this season as I look at God's word? And I want to suggest to you that the Bible has an answer to every single question I ask. And here's what I want to do this morning. I want to begin to introduce you to this, um, this, this, this series of sermons entitled Just Like Us by taking you um, for a moment to James chapter 5. This particular series, just like us, is going to be based on 1 Kings chapter 17, 18 and 19. But before we go to 1 Kings chapter 17, let's turn in our Bible to James chapter 5. And as you turn to James chapter 5, you realize in the last few verses of James chapter 5, James is talking about the prayer of faith. And as you come down to verse 17, this is what James says. In verse 17, James says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. And that's where I got my sermon title, Just Like Us. Elijah is a man just like us. And then the Bible says, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. That's the second thing I want you to know. One, Elijah was a man just like us. So Elijah was a man who is just like you and me in, in every single way. Secondly, Elijah prayed that it would not rain. And the Bible says for three and a half years, it did not rain. And so in some ways, Elijah then goes through a season of uncertainty for those three and a half years. This is not a COVID season, but this is a famine season. This is a season when King Ahab is after Elijah. This is a season of great uncertainty. This is a season of great unease. And yet in the midst of that season God is at work in the life of Elijah and the Bible records his story for us in 1st Kings chapter 17 18 and 19 as I read 1st Kings chapter 17 18 and 19 I realize that the Bible records for us in these three chapters Elijah before the famine we're going to look at 1st Kings chapter 17 verse 1 for our meditation today that's Elijah before the famine and then as you look at 1st Kings chapter 17 verse 2 all the way till the end of chapter 18. This is Elijah during the famine. What does this man of God experience as he goes through this really trial time in his life? And then as you come to 1 Kings chapter 19, the Bible presents to us Elijah after the famine. And as we read these chapters and as we study these amazing lessons from the life of Elijah, I want to request you to do me 
one big favor. What do I want you to do? One of the things that we've enjoyed in these online services has been the interaction with our viewers. People have written to us, people have encouraged us, people have shared stories from their own lives. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to do two things. One, as you listen to these messages on Elijah, evaluate yourself. How have you done in this COVID season? And that's why I wanted to call this the COVID examination. I want to examine myself as to how I did as God's child as I went through this season of the COVID. So number one, as you listen to these messages, evaluate your own experience through this COVID season. Number two, I want to suggest to you that every single person, your story in this COVID season is very unique. What God did in my life is very different from God, what God did in your life. In fact, I am able to be in your house this morning. I'm able to share this message message with you this morning because of the COVID pandemic. Before the COVID pandemic, we were not online, but thanks to the COVID pandemic, we are now online bringing these messages right into your homes. And we want to thank God for the many amazing lessons we've learned through all of these many challenges in this season. So in some ways, I'd like us to start to write down the lessons we've learned, start to write down amazing, amazing stories we've learned and share those stories with us because I'd like to use some of those stories as part of my messages and I'd like to also share those stories with friends and families so that they can be encouraged. Now as I read 1 Kings chapter 17, 18 and 19, I realize that in these three chapters there are several themes that I can pick up. Number one, I can pick up the theme of Elijah's proclamation. Number two, I can pick up the theme of God's provisions. Number three, I can pick up the theme of God's protection. Number four, I can pick up the theme of God's power. I can see the priority of the prophet of God. I can see the prayers of the prophet of God. I can see the problems of the prophet of God. I can see the presence of God. I can see the purpose of God in the life of Elijah. It's amazing as I look at just 1 Kings chapter 17, 18 and 19, there are so many lessons that I can learn. And here's what a suggestion that I want to make for you, make to you, try and read those chapters. Even as we go through the series, try and read those chapters. And my prayer is that God would speak to us in deep and personal ways and draw us to himself. This morning, we want to look at 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1. And as I read this particular verse for you, I want to just place before you our outline for this morning. What is our outline for today morning sermon? Just two words. Number one, in a season of compromise, Elijah is a man of courage. In a season of compromise, Elijah is a man of courage. And 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1 presents to us the reason for the courage of Elijah. In a season of compromise, this is a man of courage. And we ask ourselves, how did this man do it? And 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 gives us the answer. Let me read for you 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1. Just one verse, but it's a verse that is so packed with encouraging truths from the heart of God. 1 Kings chapter 17, I am reading to you at verse 1. The Bible says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tish in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. What a powerful verse, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Many amazing lessons for us to learn. But let me paint for you the context. Like I said, this was a season of compromise. As I think of this being a season of compromise, what are some of the words that come to my mind? Number one, this was a season of irreverence to Yahweh, Yahweh God. This was a season of irreverence. Look with me as I read for you. First Kings chapter 16. I'm reading to you verses 29 and verse 30. 29 and verse 30. The Bible says, In the 38th year of Asa king of Judah, 
Ahab son of Omri became king of Israel and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Verse 30, Ahab son of Omri did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says Ahab was the king in this particular season when Elijah goes through this very, very challenging time in his life. And who was this man Ahab? He was a man who had absolutely no reverence for Yahweh God. In fact, the Bible says he became king and he reigned for 22 years. And the Bible says he did more evil than all of the kings that lived before him. So this was a season of great irreverence. Number two, this was not only a season of irreverence, this was a season of immorality. This was a season of immorality. Look with me your Bible. I'm reading to you verse 31. He not only commit, considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve the Baals and to worship him. In fact, when, when the Bible talks about bad kings, right? When the Bible talks about the bad kings of the household of Israel, the Bible also always compares those bad kings of the household of Israel to Jeroboam son of Nebat. In other words, Jeroboam son of Nebat was the standard of bad. But when the Bible talks about Ahab, the Bible says he made Jeroboam son of Nebat look really fantastic. He made Jeroboam son of Nebat look fantastic, right? This is a man that did such terrible thing. So this was not only a season of irreverence, this was a season of immorality. Note what the Bible says, that this man considered it trivial, trivial to live this sinful life. He made Jeroboam son of Nebat, who was the standard of sinfulness, look like a small child. This was a evil season. And then the Bible says he even married Jezebel. In fact, the Bible is talking about how this man had absolutely no respect for the word of God, had absolutely no respect for the standards of God and lived the most immoral standard of life. So on the one hand, this was a season that was characterized by irreverence. Number two, this was a season that was characterized by immorality. Number three, this was a season that was characterized by idolatry. The Bible says in the, the end of verse 31, the Bible says he not only married Jezebel, but he also began to serve the Baals and to worship them. Look at verse 32. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal and he that he built in Samaria. Verse 33, Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more, uh, did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. So you note as you're looking at the context, as you're looking at the compromise of the season in which the Bible presents for us the life of Elijah. Oh, this was a season of irreverence to Yahweh God. This was a season of immorality. This was a season of idolatry. When you come down to chapter 21, you have the story of Naboth's vineyard. You know, the king wanting Naboth's vineyard and Naboth not wanting to give his vineyard to the king. So what does the queen decide to do? She decides to murder a man so that they can then have the vineyard of this man. So what do you see? This was a season of injustice, a season where the, the law meant nothing, a season when the law could be easily subverted, a season when people did whatever their hearts pleased to do. So it was a season of irreverence. It was a season of immorality. It was a season of idolatry. It was a season of injustice. And number five, it was a season of intimidation. As you look at chapter 17, 18 and 19, one of the things that will become really clear is the way in which Ahab is pursuing Elijah and he's doing everything he can to intimidate Elijah. He's doing everything he can to get Elijah. And whenever he can't get Elijah, he's even intimidating the kings and the kingdoms where he thinks Elijah is hiding. Oh, this was a man who was 
intimidating people. So as you're looking at the context, as you're looking at the context in which the Bible paints for us the story of Elijah, all this was a season of great compromise. It was a season of irreverence. It was a season of immorality. It was a season of idolatry. It was a season of injustice. And it was a season of intimidation. And in some ways, as we look at our own experiences even today, there are in, the, in those five words that I put before you, there are in many ways experiences that we have in our lives where we've seen people who are irreverent to God, where we've seen acts of great immorality, where we've seen idolatry at its worst forms, where we've seen injustice, and we've seen um, intimidation of people, and we've seen people going through the worst of situations. Now, it's in that context that the Bible presents to us, in that context of great compromise, a man of courage. In fact, the Bible begins in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 by saying, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishb in Gilead said to Ahab, I'd like you to just mark that in your Bible. Here's the context, right? The context of absolute compromise, the context of absolute evil, the context of absolute, absolute horrible kind of lifestyle. And into that context comes a man by the name of Elijah who has the courage to confront that evil. He comes out there and the Bible says that he confronts Ahab in his sinfulness. And like I said to you, in that one verse, in verse uh, chapter 1, sorry, chapter 17, verse 1, in that one verse, there are three amazing lessons that I learned. Three amazing lessons that are really, really important for us to be a people who can be courageous in the most compromising season. So I want to ask ourselves this morning, how can I be courageous in a season of compromise? And I want to suggest to you three words that we want to think about this morning. Number one, Elijah was absolutely, absolutely certain about the reality of God. Number two, Elijah was absolutely, absolutely certain that he was a representative of God. And number three, Elijah was absolutely, absolutely certain of his resources in God. Elijah knew the reality of God. Elijah knew that he was a representative of God. And Elijah knew his resources in God. Look with me at 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 again. The Bible says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishb in Gilead said to Ahab, Then note in your Bible, As the Lord the God of Israel lives. That's the first phrase I'd like you to mark in your Bible. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives. As Elijah stands before Ahab in this really dark, in this really terrible time, as he stands before Ahab and he confronts Ahab, he is able to do that because Elijah is absolutely, absolutely convinced about the reality of his God. Elijah has no doubts about who his God is and it is because Elijah knows who his God is that he is able to stand courageously in difficult times. And I want to suggest to you this morning as we look back on this COVID season, as we look back on struggle seasons in our life, we are able to come through those struggle seasons victorious when we have absolutely no doubt about the reality of God in our lives. It's almost like the story of that little boy sitting on an aeroplane and the aeroplane's going through the worst of turbulence, right? And as it's going through the worst of turbulence, everybody is holding on to one another. People have got that travel sickness bags. People are closing their eyes. They're crying out and saying, God, please protect us. But here is this little boy sitting down, just playing with his, with his, uh, with his video game and he's having a great time. He's laughing, he's smiling, and everybody's looking at the little boy and they're wondering how he's able to be so calm. Finally, the plane lands. The pilot announces, he says, I'm really sorry that we had to go through this terrible time of turbulence. Everybody's clapping their hands because of the pilot's brilliance in flying that fly flight to safety. The pilot is standing at the door. Everybody wants to go up and wish him. And all of a sudden, everybody in that plane realizes the reason why that boy was so calm. He jumps up from his seat, runs straight to 
the pilot hugs him and says daddy and then as everybody looks at the boy they say to themselves now we know why the little fellow was so confident you know why because he knew his father was the pilot and that's exactly what I see in Elijah Elijah is confident Elijah is courageous Elijah is bold as he goes through this very trying time because he knows the reality of his God he knows that his God is in control he knows that his God is going to have the last word he knows that Ahab is not boss he knows that God is king of kings and Lord of Lords look at that phrase with me again as the Lord the God of Israel lives as I look at that one phrase I put down three words in my notes number one Elijah knew that his God is powerful he begins by saying the Lord the Lord and as he says the words the Lord he is declaring to Ahab he is declaring to all of Ahab's forces he is declaring to the very corrupt times in which he's living he is declaring to them that this god that i worship is lord he is lord over all of the universe he is creator he is sustainer he is all powerful he is high and lifted up his trains fill the temple he is king of kings and lord of lords there is none like him he is the one who is able to lead his children victorious he is the one who is all powerful he's omnipotent God he is Lord he is powerful as the Lord the one who is powerful the second thing that he says as the Lord the God of Israel lives number two he is not only a powerful God he is a personal God he is not just a powerful Lord he is a personal God the Lord who is the God of Israel oh he is the God that has led his children all of these years he is the God who has provided for his children he is the God who has protected his children he is the God who's given his word to his children who is like this God who loves his children with a passion who is like this God who went into a foreign nation and brought out his children because of his love for them who is like this God who is personally involved in the life of his children oh he is powerful God oh he is personal God and thirdly he says he is present God as the Lord the God of Israel lives this is a God who who is present right now he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me he talks with me I know he's alive he tells me I am his own so as you're looking at first Kings chapter 17 and verse 1 the first lesson that you take away is that Elijah is able to be courageous in a season of compromise because he is aware of the reality of his God his God is powerful God his God is personal God and his God is present God and this morning the question I want to ask you as you look back on this COVID season is every single day of your life have you been able to live that day saying as surely as the Lord the God of Israel lives I'll never forget I was a student at Madras Christian College and there was a time when Tom White came to Madras Christian College and we, uh, he met with the student Christian movement uh, students. Uh, for those of you who don't know Tom White, Tom White is a man that deeply loved the Lord Jesus and felt called to drop literature over Cuba. And this was in a time when the Cubans were totally, totally opposed to the things of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what would Tom White do? He would fly his aircraft low over Cuba and he would drop Christian literature so that people would be able to pick up that literature and read about the love of Jesus. Now the Cuban officials were very aware that Tom White was doing this all the time and they were looking for an opportunity to get Tom White and then one day as Tom White was flying his aircraft very low and dropping literature over Cuba he had an accident and his flight landed right in the center of all in, the, in, 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 in full view of the Cuban authorities and Tom White was taken into prison 
and then began one of the worst seasons of persecution in his life. And I'll never forget as a young student listening to Tom White speak, one of the experiences he shared is etched in my mind forever. And I've used this story many times because I heard him share, share this story. He talked about one of these Cuban guards, one of these really terrible guards who persecuted him a lot. You know, one of the things that this Cuban guard would do is that he would tie Tom White and throw him into a very freezing, freezing area. It would be so cold and you know he would leave Tom White there till you know Tom White was almost frozen to death and then he would pull him out and then he would laugh you know as Tom White came on and his body was trying to readjust to the to the warmer weather this guy would laugh and you know many times as he would laugh he would look at Tom White and say hey Tom White your God is not God I am God look I've got you in my hand your God is not God. I am God. Look, I've got you in my hands. What can your God do to save you? And I'll never forget as a young person, Tom White very calmly looked at that God and said, Sir, you are not Lord. You don't have me in your hand because you don't have a long enough pencil. Now, you know, that guard was taken aback and I was taken aback too. I mean, what kind of an answer is this? Maybe this man is delirious because of the cold. You don't have a long enough pencil. So the guard's taken aback. He turns around to Tom White and says, what do you mean I don't have a long enough pencil? And Tom White very calmly tells the man, I want to tell you this. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you don't have a long enough pencil to cut it out. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you don't have a long enough pencil to cut it out. I know the reality of my God. Even as I go through the valley of pain, even as I go through the valley of persecution, even as I go through the valley of uncertainty, even as I go through the valley of great struggle, one of the things that I'm absolutely conscious of is the reality of my God. As the Lord, the God of Israel lives. He is powerful God. He is personal God. He is present God. He is real. He lives. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. And this morning, that's one of the lessons we want to carry with us into this week. Every moment in this week, as we face those challenges, as we go through those difficult seasons in our relationships with people, as we go through those challenging work situations, as we deal with a health situation that is weighing us down, let's stop and say, God, I thank you that you are alive. I thank you for the reality of my God as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives. The second thing that Elijah says in that particular verse is that he's not only convinced about the reality of God, he is convinced that he is a representative of God. Not what the Bible says, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve whom I serve. I am a representative of this God. And that changes everything again. In the midst of a compromising season, in the midst of a difficult season, in the midst of a dark season, here is a man of courage. How is he a man of courage? Yes, he knows the reality of God, but he also knows that he is a representative of God for that particular season. And one of the things that I think God really challenged me through this COVID season is have we really been representatives of God? I'll never forget. I was talking to a doctor, a doctor friend of ours, as we're going through this COVID season, calling him and talking to him about different people that were going through the COVID. And even as we went through the COVID, calling this doctor and talking to him and asking him adv advice on the kind of medicines to take. And one of the things that he said, this will stay in my mind forever. He said, hey, listen to me, Ashok. Aren't you the men of faith? Aren't you the guys who preach from the word of God? Aren't you the people who say that this God is able to carry me through and he knows my future? If that's the case, what kind of life are you living? Are you fearing like the rest? Are you worried about death? Are you constantly anxious about getting the COVID or are you able to recognize that God is sovereign in these seasons? Now, this is not a Christian doctor. This is a doctor who is a good friend of mine. And I know he said it to me jokingly, but it's something that stayed in my heart. You know what he was saying to me? He was saying to me, hey, Ashok, God is giving you an opportunity to represent him in this season. And that's a question I want to ask you. Did you represent God well in the COVID season?
Can you say this morning? Yes, I represented God well in the COVID season. My neighbors came to me and they asked me, how come you are able in the midst of this uncertain season to still be able to walk as that man, woman of faith? How come there is peace in your family in the midst of this difficult time? How come you are still able to rejoice in the midst of a loss of a job? How come you are so different? You know, I am a representative of Jesus Christ in the world that I live in. Now the, the Elijah, as he, as he speaks to King Ahab, he says, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. As I look at that one phrase, whom I serve, there are two words I put down in my notes. Number, word, number one, Elijah knew that he received his authority from God. This was a man whose authority for whatever he did came from God. He is an ambassador of of Jesus Christ in the place that I'm placed in oh this is a dark place this is a difficult place this is a dangerous place in the midst of that place I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ my authority comes from him and from him alone and so no matter what the circumstances I'm able to stand firm in those circumstances and continue to be light continue to be salt you know why because my authority comes from him who is king of kings and lord of Lord. So on the one hand, I recognize that when Elijah makes that particular statement, um, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, it's a statement of my authority comes from him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My mind rushes off to um, Moses at the burning bush, right? As Moses says, is at the burning bush, he's asking God, God, when I go to the people, they're going to ask me, who sent you? Who are you? And he says, go and tell them, I am has sent you. Go and tell them, I am has sent you. You are not going in your power. You are going in my authority. Never forget that. Never forget that every single moment as a child of God, wherever you are, you are living not by your power. You are living by his authority. I am has sent you. Number two, what does it do as a representative of God? It creates a new authenticity. I am not only one who is aware of my authority. I am has sent me. Secondly, I am one who is concerned about my authenticity in a world that is in so many ways compromising, in a world that is in so many ways contrary to the word of God, in a, in a world that is in so many ways dark and dreary. What do I do? I am a man who is authentic in the way I live my life. I am different from the world. I am in the world, but I am not of the world or the authenticity of my life because I am an ambassador of Jesus. Jesus Christ. I am a representative of Jesus Christ. And the question I want to ask you this morning is that as you look back on this COVID season, can you honestly say, I've been a good representative of Jesus Christ. As a doctor in my field of being a medical doctor, I've been a good representative of Jesus Christ. As a teacher, there's been really difficult times for the students, but I've represented Jesus well. I have done what other teachers haven't done. I've gone the extra mile. I've called my students. I've visited them. I've prayed for them every day as a person in my workplace this has been difficult times but i have given a 200 person can you say this morning honestly i have been a representative of jesus christ every time i think about driving schools you know i always laugh uh, in fact very recently rahel finished her driving school and she got her license and so she drives around but when you think of driving schools we think of those you know driving school cars and for those of you who've learned in a driving school car, one of the things that you know is that these driving school cars are beaten up. You know, the gears are not working very well. The doors are not closing very well. It's those really beaten up kind of cars that we use for our driving schools, don't we? I heard a friend talking about something that he saw that left uh, an impression in his mind that he'd never forget. He'd, he was visiting a particular town and he saw this beautiful, beautiful red Mustang and it was driving down and it was an, an eye-catching Mustang. It was so beautiful and as he looked at that particular car, he saw two writings on that car. Number one, he had the name of the driving school and the number of the driving school. And beside that, they had written these words, drive this Mustang. And my friend said, this was so different because when you look at all of these other driving school cars, it's run down, beaten up, 
you know, falling apart. But this was like the most incredible, the most beautiful Mustang, red, beautiful. And it had on the back, hey, you know what? You want to learn driving? We are the authorities. But on the other hand was this little catchphrase, drive this Mustang. And people were making a beeline to be able to drive that Mustang because it was such a beautiful car and they were teaching people to drive. And as I think of that illustration, I think sometimes that that's the kind of person I need to be. I am an authority. I'm able to teach because I receive my authority from Jesus Christ. I'm able to speak the truths of God. And yet there is an authenticity. I don't live a shoddy life. I live a life that truly reveals the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So as you're looking at Elijah, number one, he knew the reality of God. Number two, he knew that he was a representative of God. And number three, he knew his resources in God. What does the Bible says? As surely as the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither rain or dew upon the land for the next few years, except at my words. Now, how did Elijah manage to say those words? How did he manage to stand there and say, there will be no rain, there will be no dew, except at my word. Here's how he did it. He knew his resources in God. What are those resources? Two resources. Number one is the resource of the scriptures. How did Elijah do that? Turn with me in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and look at verse 23. As you look at Deut Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 23, God says, when my children live in sin, I will shut the heavens. I will make the skies like bronze. I will shut the heavens. Let's just quickly turn in our Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And let me read for you verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And I'm reading to you verse 23. The Bible says, The sky over your head will be like bronze. The ground beneath you will be like iron. You know what God is saying? God is saying, when you live in sin, I will shut. The, the heavens. It will become like bronze. There will be not a drop of rain, no dew that will come upon the land. What is Elijah doing? He's standing upon the word of God. As he stands before Elijah, he says, as he stands before Ahab, he says, Ahab, there will be no rain on this land except at my word. You know why? Because I'm standing upon the scriptures. God said in his word, when his children disobey, when his children live irreverent lives, when his children live immoral lives, when his children do injustice, uh, live in injustice. God said, I will shut the heavens. I will not allow a drop of rain to come upon the land. So as you're looking at God's word, Elijah stands before Ahab as a man who knows his resources in God. He knows the scriptures. And secondly, if you turn with me in your Bible to the book of James, you realize that Elijah not only knew the resource of the scriptures, Elijah knew the resource of supplication. Elijah knew the resource of supplication. The passage of scripture that I just read for you, um, James chapter 5, the Bible says Elijah was a human being even as we are and then the bible says he prayed earnestly he prayed earnestly and as he prayed earnestly god did an amazing miracle isn't that beautiful isn't that beautiful that as elijah went through a difficult season elijah was one whom god used in a special way because he knew his resources in god he knew the scriptures he not only knew the scriptures he also knew the power of supplication he also knew what it was to spend time with god john knox John Knox, this great man of God who lived his entire life preaching the word and praying. As he came to the end of his life, he was very, very weak and tired and he was frail and his body was shaking and it was a very difficult time and his wife and family were sitting around and they're watching this powerful man of God going through those last few moments of his life on the earth. And then John Knox straightened himself and he said to his wife, he said, take my Bible and read for me the passage that began my entire journey with Jesus Christ. Read for me the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. And so his wife picked up the high priestly prayer and she read the high priestly prayer. And when she finished the last verse of John chapter 17, John Knox rose from his bed, this frail man who was shaking, who was weak. He rose from his bed, knelt down upon his knees and he began to pray. 
all of his fears gone all of his worries gone back in the scriptures back in supplication he began to pray he prayed for the many many people who heard the gospel through his life he prayed for people that were being persecuted because of Jesus Christ he prayed for the many that are accepting Jesus Christ he prayed for his family and friends and as he prayed and as he prayed and as he prayed people were all standing around he prayed his way into heaven what a beautiful way to go right he prayed himself into heaven a man who lived by the scriptures and by supplication as we head into this week many of us will face challenges just like elijah faced those challenges but as we face those challenges let's remember the reality of god let's remember we are representatives of god and let's remember our resources in God. The second question I want to leave you with, as you look back on this COVID season, have you walked every day knowing the reality of God? Have others seen that in your life? Number two, have you represented God well in this COVID season? Every opportunity that you got, you represented him well. And number three, every single day, have you relied upon the resources of the scriptures and supplication? Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed this morning, we've just heard God's word. We've looked at Elijah in the most compromising season, a man of courage. And as we look at Elijah, number one, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the reality of God, whom I serve, the representative of God, there will be no rain except at my word, the resources in God. This morning, will we come to God and say, God, I want to be conscious of your reality. I want to thank you that I'm your representative. And Lord, I want to, in many ways, recommit myself to the resources that are available for me in the scriptures and in supplication. Father, this morning, we thank you for speaking to us from your word. And we plead today that this word will continue, Lord, continue to work in our lives your most amazing purposes to fulfill. So we commit, Lord, one another into your hands. And Lord, even as we prepare ourselves to celebrate around the Lord's table, we pray that you would make this a time when we would allow you, Holy Spirit, to examine our heart. And a time when we can recommit ourselves to live every moment knowing the reality of our Father. To live every moment knowing that we represent our Father. And to live every moment knowing the resources available in our Father. Be honored, Lord, be glorified. For we ask with a grateful heart. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. What a joy it is for us to be able to celebrate around the Lord's table. To look back and hear Jesus say, it is finished. So as we take the bread and the cup in our hands this morning, we rejoice in the finished work of Jesus Christ. To look forward, Jesus is coming again. As we take the bread and the cup this morning, we rejoice that Jesus is coming again. But we also allow the Holy Spirit to search us this morning in light of his word as we celebrate around the Lord's table. Moment of silence, every eye closed and every head bowed. Father, we thank you for the finished work of Calvary. We thank you that Jesus is coming soon. And we ask that every day we would be conscious of the reality of our Father. We would be good representatives of our Father. And we would stand upon the resources we have in you, O God. As we celebrate around the table this morning, draw us closer to yourself. For we ask with a grateful heart, in Jesus' name, Amen. The Bible says, Jesus took bread and having given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we quickly pass the bread around in our own families so that we can partake of the bread together? Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me can we pass the cups around quickly in our homes this morning as we prepare to celebrate the cup the reminder of his shed blood This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, this morning we want to thank you again at the end of this service for reminding us, Lord, that in the most difficult times we can still be a people that bring you honor. as we recognize and lord as we know that you are lord powerful god you are personal god you are present god as we know the reality of our god as we know that we are the representatives of our god and as we know our resources in you and so lord we ask that this would be a week of victory that this month would be a month of a closer walk with you And now we pray that the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen.